Morning. Welcome to this day. Um, I just wanted to give you a piece of information concerning your presentation this afternoon before uh, Philip takes over. Um, as you can see in the, in the program, from, from four to six, you will present your uh, projects verbally and, and visually. So, uh, and as you can also see, we only have two hours. So it's a very short presentation. It's like maybe six minutes or something like that. Um, so um, uh, uh, please, pr please prepare a short presentation so that you know that it will just be one by one. We won't, it, it's, it's for all of us to get to know your project, you know, so it's not a, we won't have a discussion or comments or anything afterwards. It's, it's really to make sure that everybody knows each other's project, right? Um, and in terms of the visuals, if you could hand them in to the technician up there, whether it's on a stick or a DVD or whatever, because then he will download it to his computer so that we can run it from there. Um, and if you can do it either immediately after the session, uh, before you go to a coffee break, or uh, half an hour, uh, he will be here also half an hour before, um, before we start. But that's actually in the middle of Eva's and, and uh, Emma's inspirational lecture. So it's only for those of you who have it ready, please hand it in to him after this lecture. And if you don't have it prepared for that, there is a, a, an option just before we start, but it's, it's absolutely best if you do it right after this. Okay? And if, you ha and if it's on a DVD, make sure that it's marked with a title so that he can put them in in the right order, okay? Okay, yes? Yes? Yes. Very good. So, now I'll just hand the word over to you, Philip. I think you can present yourself and what you are doing. First of all, apologies for me standing up. Not because I'm a broadcaster or working for a broadcaster, but my arm is not long enough to go there. So I have to stand between you and this machine. I will try to explain a bit about what the television landscape of tomorrow would, will look like. I have a background in documentary, I was a documentary maker, commissioning editor, and now I'm working for the corporate strategy department of VRT, which is a public broadcast in Belgium, Flanders, on the Flemish-speaking side. So since a few months, my business is looking into the future of television and media, and so I want to share some of those insights with you. Why? Well, because documentary is doing quite well in Europe and also outside. There are many good films made, many good films produced, and films that travel and get awards. So there's also a new generation of filmmakers standing up since a few years. And they started making films that matter, films about issues that are relevant for today. Films on how they see the world and how they live our world. Also films for an audience. An audience that wants to know what happens in this world, that wants a bigger picture than the one we are getting in the television news every evening. Films with a story also, because story provides context and helps us to bring a structure in the chaos that is surrounding us. That's important. That's why documentary is important in its many forms, as we will see, and maybe today more than ever. Films also about change, because we are living in a period of change. Look at what happened in Japan 25 years after Chernobyl. Look at the Arab Spring, which is not a spring for everybody. So all this, 
all that is surrounding us is changing. Some of the change is less obvious, it's more transient, but enables us to get a better grip on the world. Technology, and that's one of the main drivers we will be talking about. The tablet, the iPad, is radically changing the world, uh, the, the way in which we interact with media. Desktop is fading out, you know this. All users want to carry their device with them and have access to all types of content. And you know the slogan right here, right now. I'm not sure you can see it, it's the famous night watch of Rembrandt. It's a classical painting hanging in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And it's also a piece of video art made by Peter Greenaway, the famous British filmmaker. Greenaway was the one who in 2004 told us that cinema is dead. For him, Museum will be the next generation cinemas, where people will go in order to have a multi-dimensional multi experience, meaning not just watching objects in a static display, but interact with them. So anyone who has experienced this video installation of the Night Watch of Rembrandt will know what he's talking about. What does Greenaway say? What's the use of sitting still in a dark room for 90 minutes? Watching something move on a two-dimensional screen? We can do much better now. He is almost 70 years, but a staunch believer in the benefits of new or digital media. I was a bit younger when, I think it was in Athens, I challenged an audience of aspiring filmmakers like you by telling them that television is dead, but doesn't know it yet. The leader of the workshop, I think many of you know him, Tewer Stin Miller, he was a bit pissed off because most of his aspiring students wanted to make nice documentary films for broadcasters. So some of them still challenge me today, ask me, and television, is it dead? No, of course it is not, it's very much alive. You know this, people are watching more than ever. In my country, people watch four and a half hours of television every day. That's enormous, that's a record. But television is changing and more than we can see, not television itself, it's still producing and distributing the same content, more or less the same way. But it's the way the audience, you, are interacting with media and with television that is changing. So the concept of broadcasting is shifting. It's no more shouting from the ivory tower where every broadcaster is sitting. No, it's having or trying to have a conversation. You, you are not sitting as a mass audience before a television screen. Who is sitting at home before the television screen? It's you, it's your partner, and it's your dog. That's it. So a broadcaster has to engage a conversation on that level. I'm talking to a mass. But when I'm at home and talking with you, I engage in a personal conversation. That's what broadcasting should go for. And also, you don't want to sit anymore and watch media. No, you want to get your hands on media. You want to access it when you feel like it, and not the challenge programmer. Sorry, the channel. You want access when it's convenient for you. When I want to see a nice documentary of an aspiring filmmaker, why do I have to wait until half past 11 to see it? I want to see it when it's convenient for me and not for the scheduler. Can I see it in a catch-up? No, because they didn't secure the rights. Can I see it on the channel website? No, for the same reason. But. I can wait for the rerun. That's what they promised me. Next season, 
Am I a satisfied customer? Yes. No. Another example. Who in the room has digital television at home? Please raise your finger. Who is watching digital? One? Two? Who has a PVR, a personal video recorder? Three? Four. Okay. What is a PVR? I think you know. It allows you to watch a program with a delay, meaning you don't have to sit before the set at 8 o'clock to watch the news. You can see it at 9, 10, whatever. But in my country, delayed viewing with the PVR is almost having 20% of the market share, meaning one out of five viewers is watching it with a delay, not when the broadcaster is broadcasting it. And what do people do when they watch a program with a delay? I think you know it. They skip the ads. They skip the commercials. That's the main driver for people to have a PVR. Finally, you can watch all these programs without having to go to, to all these awful commercials. Do I like this? Yes, I love it. Do the commercial broadcasters like this? They are very afraid because their business model is crumbling. So what they are trying now, and this is really new, uh, it's only some months, they're building a new PVR and they call it Horizon. And what will this new PVR do? It will block the ad skipping, meaning you will not be able to skip the ads anymore. Will you like this? What will you do? Find something new. So this is a dead-end model. Traditional linear television. Linear, I think you understand. It's being broadcasted. It's, it's being watched as, at, as it is broadcast. When it's broadcasted, sorry. This is dying. Some of the key factors for this big change since 2004. I think you know most of them, so I will go through them very quickly. It's the switch from analog to digital, production, storage, distribution. More and more broadcasters are going for a completely integrated digital system. It's also development of new technology. So there is a real big jump forward on the level of IT and ICT. Broadband internet is growing very fast all over Europe and also the cost of storage, of digital storage, is going down with half every six months. How, how much do you pay a terabyte now in Greece? 80 euros, 90 euros? Now in Belgium we're paying 69 euros for one terabyte of personal storage. I think one year ago it was over 250 euros. So it's going very fast. What is the impact of this change? You know them, the new devices, new networks, 3G, 4G is coming up, new services on those networks. And on the media level, and that is what we will be talking about, convergence of all media. All media are coming together. Why? Because they're digital. And so the customer is going for an integrated, media experience. What do we expect from media? VRT and other broadcasters did it also, did a big survey to, in order to understand what the customers want. And it's a Flemish side, but I translated the key concepts. Media are there to make my life enjoyable for one group of the audience. Media are there, are there to keep my life under control and media are there to enrich my life. Those are the three drivers, the three reasons why people access media. Of course, there's many, many more, eh, as you can see, on those to access, there are many different reasons to have fun, to take care for, to belong to a group, to be perfect, whatever. It's a large, large, large scale. And so this, these expectations of the customers for the media experience can be translated 
in nine different fields on which media can be experienced. You can experience it common, meaning in a group, personal, you alone, and also mobile, you take it with you. Linear, traditional television or radio listening. Non-linear, like the delay. Multimedia, having access to multimedia services, having access to extra services provided through the media. And so if you put this on this grid, you can see that instead of the old system, which was number one, a classical linear way of delivering media content, now broadcasters can operate on nine different fields. This is a huge expansion. And if you fill those nine fields, you can see what it gives. A linear common experience is, like, is watching, still watching the old football game with your friends before the telly at home. Non-linear, screening a nice DVD. Multimedia, teletext. It's also on the telly. Personal linear, television over the internet. Listening to, maybe you know it, Last FM, it's a kind of digital online radio station that yourself you can program. Sending MS MMSs, multimedia service personal. Mobile, car radio linear, non-linear, iPad, iPod, playing a game, PSP. On all those nine fields, broadcasters can operate. I will skip this one, it's too complicated. And so all this delivers a new experience. And the first one, and I think you know it, it's going from lean back, watching television, to hands-on. From television to the PC or the laptop. And then from hands-on, I can take it with me. So from the PC, from the laptop, to the iPad and the smartphone. This allows you to watch what you want, when and where. And instead of one screen, today broadcasters have to manage four screens. And you know them. Who has four screens at home? Meaning a TV, desktop laptop, iPad, smartphone. Who has three screens? Okay, you see, it's gone. The fourth screen will come up very quickly. And the most important is the last word. Digital media users want it to be a seamless experience, meaning going from one device to the other without any effort. Who remembers Joost? Nobody. That's great because it was a bad. This was the promise of Joost in 2005. It's great. It's TV anytime, TV anywhere. There were hundreds of full screen shows. You were in charge. You programmed whatever you wanted to watch, whenever you wanted to watch it. And at the same time, you could chat, you could message, you could search. It was all there in one experience. But it was a bit a big bug. If you go to choose now, that's what you get. Choose is dead. There was no business model that was valid. So the whole talk of a brave new world, there's still a big question mark. As for now, there's no valid business model yet. We will go into detail later on, but it's already a signpost I want to put up now. Don't believe everything you hear. There's a big but. There's another one. Who knows the iPlayer from BBC? I think you should. Does it work? Is it valid for you? Can you tell it? Can you tell us what it delivers for you? On the experience level? Well, I think that was the first thing that I used to do when I was in the the whole catalog, more or less. Yeah. So it's very nice, very promising, but not for us, because it's geo-blocked. So outside Britain, you cannot access it. 
yeah, well, a bypass. This is for the coffee break. <laughs> I won't do this officially. So, but it will go global. iPlayer is, go, is going global. And the main reason is, of course, because BBC is selling a lot of its content. So, giving it for free through internet is not a business model for them. What is the new audience for digital media? What do they expect? They're not listening anymore. They're not watching anymore. They want to have access. They want to do more than just consume media. They also start producing media. The audience is and will become more and more part of media. The TV screen in the future could have just two channels. One is for everything that's being transmitted live, meaning happening right now, like the Queen's Jubilee or football match or whatever. And the second one is for everything which is stored somewhere online, in the Apple Store, in the cloud, wherever, on your personal hard drive, wherever. And so one of the challenges for documentary makers will be, how do I find this in this enormous forest of content, how will I find your documentary? That's an issue. The audience wants also what they call witch content, meaning just more than just a program. They want, if they like it and they are interested in it, they really want to dig into your story. And from more than one source, they want many sources and they prefer to have them access to them together. Anyone who has a kid of 15 knows how they can interact with the different screens and the different sources and take content from one to the other. That's a future audience for documentaries. They are not watching them on television. They want a better experience. And the main question is, how can I engage with your content, with your program? On the other side, there is the new broadcaster. How will he make the difference? There's a lot of competition. You can see it up there. There's cable TV, video on demand, internet TV, Netflix delivering content straight to your computer, iPlayer, Google TV. So there are two ways for a broadcaster for the moment to make a difference. It's focusing on big live events. That's where a broadcaster can make the difference. So sports, all live events, this is a unique experience. You can only watch it when it happens. And the second one is series. Who is watching television series? Who is a fan of television series? You are, you are, you are. Okay, nice, very nice. Why are you watching them? Enjoy, yeah. And how do you like the broadcaster experience of de delivering the series to you, meaning you have to wait. In the delay? Yes, of course. Are you happy if you didn't have access that way? Would you be happy to have to wait one week to see the next installment? Oh, okay. Okay. So that's what many people do. They don't wait for the next installment on the broadcaster channel. They just go for the DVD, they go for internet, they leave the broadcaster. So the series could be a kind of dinosaur that, um, how do you say, that uh, last <coughs> shiver before it dies. It's very successful now. The ratings for audience are, uh, for series are very high, but it's probably also an end, dead end story. If you have a closer look at a broadcaster, what is a broadcaster? In fact, it's a content what we call aggregator. It's getting together content and put it in on a channel. Content that it produces itself. In my company, it's more or less 50%. In commercial broadcaster, it can be much, uh, much less, 20%, even less. And all the rest is aggregated from elsewhere, being produced by production companies like yours and other ones. That's a broadcast. It aggregates and brings, brings it on air. That's his business. 
But what's happening today? Today there is a delivery which we call television over the top. Many people like you over there want to have access outside the broadcaster ecosystem and they go directly to the content providers. And so what do people do is they go to online services to have access to their favorite series. You can, you can get them straight to your PC and from your PC or laptop with Apple TV and other connected TV sets, you can put them on your big screen and you can enjoy the whole evening the series you want to see. And what's the role, what's the difference of the broadcaster? How do they make the difference? Maybe because they make a subtitled version, but that's it. And many of the youngsters understand English, so they don't need the subtitles anymore. So why should they go to the local broadcaster if they, if they can get it from Apple, uh, to, uh, I, from iTunes to Apple TV on the same home set? For the moment, income from that business is pennies, but it will grow, and it is growing. Because players like iTunes, YouTube, Netflix, they are looking for premiere content, meaning content they want to show first, and not like it is now, after the broadcasters showed it. They're hunting for premiere content. And so sales from digitally only providers, eh, like those three, will start to replace some of the television sales in the, com in the coming years. So there is a major shakeup coming on. Part of the problem is the assumption that broadcasters can simply take revenue from video on demand and add this on top of the catch-up. They already have the rights for catch-up. Catch-up is you can still watch the program six days or seven after its first transmission. Why do the broadcasters do it? They want to secure the rights. Do they use them? No. In my company, many of those rights are acquired for no money and they just leave them aside. It's, you, you have to block or the com you have to block the competition. For you, producers and also distributors, this is an issue. You have to negotiate the value of those extra rights and we will explain why. Content providers do this because, have to do this, sorry, because they're facing a fragmented market. It's not just television audience anymore. There's a different, uh, there's, there are many different devices, eh, the four screen we were talking about. And they need to deliver the content through those four or five different devices to a fragmented market. Why they, do they have to do this? Because they have to follow the consumers. The consumers, eh, audience, which is leaving the traditional television screen and going to these new devices. Content providers have to follow this. It costs them money because you have to make different versions, you have to transcode, you have to do a lot of things, but the financial model, financial model is not proven yet, so there is no extra income yet. As we see today, traditional television will still remain and play a key part in this content chain, and it will offer value that for the moment will not be topped by the new over-the-top services like the one we mentioned. So television is still, still strong, but the new services, and then it's, it's getting interesting for you producers and also potential distributors, these new services are offering a competition on the market. And when there is competition, you, you know what can happen. Competition is very good. You're not facing broadcasters anymore, you're also facing those new, those new online services. Netflix is going for big shows. Not documentary yet, but this will anyhow happen. Not today, but later on. So what's the big di digital channel today? Yeah, 
I think it's quite obvious. It's working together. Broadcasters will have to work with the new services. Coexist. And why coexist? Because working together, you can build a nice, very strong brand around content. Because for television programs, you need a brand in order to appeal to the new services. If they don't know you, and they only can know you because you have been on television, if you don't have an established brand through television, nobody is going to watch you on the news services. Nobody is going to find you on Netflix, on YouTube, on Hulu and all those other ones. That's really key. So broadcasters and news services have to work together. Television will remain the core for the next 10 years. That's my guess. It can be less. So television, broadcast television will remain important. Broadcasters will become more adept, uh, more, more interested and more able to translate their content into the online world. Up until today, it was in my company and also others, two separate track, tracks. They considered the whole online business as just broadcasting on the internet, which, which it, it is not. So the, the catch-up of broadcasters will become more and more a support function instead, instead of an alternative to linear television. This is really, for broadcasters, an important lesson. When we started to build online uh, channels and develop online projects, 